Hello and welcome to another episode of the Privet Park Legends podcast. Today I'm joined by a borough legend who made 448 appearances over nine years for the club. In that time, winning promotion and the Hampshire Senior Cup. Welcome, Tony Stairs. How are you doing, Tony? Yes, good, thanks, Sam. So, how have you been doing over lockdown, you know, with restrictions uh, being yeah, eased? Not too bad. We were, uh, was out in the Caribbean on the 60th when, because mm-hmm. um, obviously we run the Pro, Pro Direct Hampshire Academy. Mm-hmm. Um, the partnership with Hampton Waterloo and that sort of got closed down. We were out there, so we sort of flew back, and within four days of being back, we were in lockdown. So, um, but luckily enough, we've been uh, able to, um, or my lecturer has been to get all the lads, the students through through Google um, online learning, so they've all completed uh, last week. And so, have you been doing anything? You know, with restrictions easing now over the last couple of weeks. Um, I've been out mainly by riding. I did play in an inter club cricket game for Gosport last Saturday once the government gave it the go ahead. Mm-hmm. Um, and it looks like there's two games this week, so it's all getting back to some more normality. How have they um, been going? Good, bad? Uh, sorry, again, much how, how have those cricket games been going? Good, yeah, bad? Yeah, played the one. It was like um, it was like a sort of almost like a rehearsal mm-hmm. for the. There's a small league program going on um, from this coming Saturday, so um, a little bit strange going to the ground, change, not going to use the changing room, having to sanitise the ball every six mm-hmm. overs, um, sanitising your cricket bat before you go out to bat <laughs> and that type of stuff, so it's all a bit, it, but that's going to be probably the future for a while, so it might be similar, and a bit similar um, sort of a regulations in grassroots football when it gets off hopefully in late September, early October. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is a bit of an old time. I mean, normal season wise, in a couple of weeks, we'd start pre season essentially for the new the campaign. Do you think we will get maybe at least a couple of you know, non league pre season friendlies in the time I'm soon, or is it nowhere yeah, near? I'm a bit pre-season. Um, I mean, we, we were, we're based at the Hampshire FA hub over at Front Lawn where we do the teaching and the coaching. Um, we from what we've been told, everything they've told us has, has actually fallen into place. So we knew about the um, the coaching where you could have six in a group, but distance learning sort of for a couple of weeks before they actually released it. Um, and I think they're probably planning, I mean, we've heard that sort of October, early October or late September mm-hmm. um, is when it might all kick off again. But um, that's obviously going to depend if there's a, if there's more sort of cases come in where people are more sort of mixing more now. Do you think in terms of like the non-league scene that it would be pointless starting the new season if fans are not allowed in? Uh, yeah, I, I do. Because obviously, fan, obviously clubs are dependent on um, crowds coming in. And, uh, and actually in non-league football, I mean, if you take Gosport's ground, there is no reason why they couldn't have a minimum mm-hmm capacity just going in there if they brought tickets in advance now with the technology online um, and obviously that would be the way to do it so I think there has been talk that um, non-league grounds might be allowed 25% or 50% capacity because they can allow for social distancing but that's only what we've heard in discussion so whether that's the case um, in September will be another matter. Do you think there should be financial support for these clubs? I mean I was a majority of these non-league clubs rely on their income brought in by fans, particularly on a match day. So if you're half of that, you know, that could mean a breaking point essentially for a club. You know, it's very well known, and I've said that could, you know, half of your income gone could mean financial disaster. Do you think the FA or the government should be putting money into I mean, replace yeah, that I'm financial? Sure about, I'm not too sure about the government. So I mean, the government has sort of aided. Um, quite a lot through grants and the furlough system. Um, maybe Premiership should pass more money down into grassroots um, uh, and do it that way. Um, I think there should be some support there, um, especially in these times. But um, whether it gets fed down into sort of down into the Southern Premier where Gospel play or to come from South. Um, is another matter. I know that um, obviously a club like haven't had. Uh, a payment, but they and it was a big thing about the FA had made this payment, but they would have got the payment anyway. But it just it was just paid early, so mm-hmm. yeah. In respect, I think maybe the Premiership should help out a little, help out a little bit more. All right. 
Well, we'll move on to your career in football now. What, when was your first memory of football? When do you remember starting to play it? Um, well, I was always sort of um, brought up around, but my late father played. He played fair and town and gospel, um, and obviously cricket for gospel. So I was I was brought up sort of an early age around cricket and and uh, and football. And um, so I mean, he out out in the would have been the sort of late sixties, early seventies. So I can remember going down to Privet Park to watch when he was out and out with the reserve side. I think it was at the time. Um, and then, as I got a little bit older, um, obviously started to play at school. Um, playing goal was a little bit of an accident because um, I used to we used to go to Privet Park for a kick about about ten or eleven of us, um, and I ended up going in goal for one game and um, thought well, I'm not not too bad at this. So I went home and told my dad I wanted to be a goalkeeper. He told me I was stupid because there was only one position you could actually play in as a goalkeeper, whereas if you're an outfield player, you could play maybe in two or three positions to get in the side. But I sort of stuck with it and, and, and I went down um, and sort of um, started to watch goalkeepers, Tony Milne especially, mm-hmm. um, who uh, was in goal at the time for gospel, um, who I knew quite well, relatively well through cricket from quite an early age because he, they played the played cricket for gospel. Position did your dad play? Um, I think he was by all accounts. I think he was a, he was a left, what they call a left wing back. But mm. um, I never actually saw him. I saw him play once on a Sunday in the in the gospel Sunday league. Most of his playing career was at Fairham Town. Mm. Um, I led to believe with um, what was a local, well-known local sportsman called Bob Fisher, who was manager. But by speaking to other people, I think in the day's game he probably lasted about two minutes. <laughs> Was there any particular side you supported? Was it Portsmouth or Southampton? Or was it mainly just whatever team your dad played for? Um, no, I mean, as I said, I didn't really see him play. I mean, as, a, as probably a youngster, sort of in, in the 70s, probably I used to follow Spurs mm-hmm. um, a little bit. but um, And then sort of more Southampton, because at the age of um, sort of 15, um, I... I came back from a coaching session over at Portsmouth with um, Ray Crawford I was at an Easter period and um, Stan Cribb, the ex-gospel manager and Tom Parker, the chief scout for Southampton were sat in the front room when I got back um, and um, I signed a social school boy forms for Southampton which mm-hmm. is slightly different now you can only sign virtually in your last year of school so you couldn't be signed by the age of 9 or 10 so, so probably had a little bit of a soft spot for Southampton, and I did go and watch them when we um, watched the season ticket older. Mm-hmm. So I probably watched them about eight or nine times this year. You said about you know teams could only sign you at you know at the age of sixteen. Do you think that system of having you know joining a club later is a better than the system that way? Like you said, you join at the age of nine or even at younger ages. You know, clubs try and sign them as early as possible. I think it's a bit of a catch-22 because a lot of the sides will sign players because they don't want to miss out on them. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of pressure on, on the academy to, to sign players. What, what I probably don't agree with is you hear talk of like 12-year-olds having three or four-year contracts. Well, maybe it should just be a, a, a year contract and then sort of progression. So, I mean, I think the academy system works. I think that's shown in the, in the professional game. 
um, with a lot of the youngsters coming through in the England side with um, Gareth Southgate. Um, but it, I don't know whether they sort of learn the the sort of hard side of the game, which you would do if you were um, going back to the old apprenticeship scheme. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's probably a lot easier today um, than when it was going back in the sort of uh, the early seventies if you're trying to make your way in the professional game. And then, so, what did you play for a local, like, Sunday side, or was it um, more school football so that was important in um, you getting well, into football I mean, and development? Sort of, um, the Portsmouth Lads League was quite a strong league, so probably up until under under 15 level, um, it, I was playing for, um, and I started off playing for Game United, which is where the Gospel Borough Youth set up originated from, went mm-hmm. over to play for Waterloo or Colts, who were the like the strongest side in the area. I don't think there was, I think there was a habit of squad of 14, 15 we, we had playing in the top league, the Portsmouth Fairs League. I think we had one player who wasn't signed on by a pro club. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, um, I sort of went, when I left school, we had to write away. So two weeks before you left school, you have to write away to see if you're going to be offered an apprenticeship term. Um, my letter come back where I was offered um, a final trial. So they obviously wanted to make their mind up. They couldn't say yes to me and they couldn't say no to me. So I was up there for about four to five weeks um, training um, Monday to Monday to Friday with the, with the the apprentices. And then on the fifth week, I got called into the office by um, Ted Bates, who was a manager at the time, and said they were sort of going to let me go. So from there, I fell back in straight into local football, really. So um, I'd already been playing at uh, 15 or 16. I was playing mm-hmm. in the Gosborne Fair and Saturday League for a side called Brockus, um, which was a pretty tough league at the time. Um, I think John always mentioned how strong the, air, the football area was, but it was a, it was a good grounding. Um, and also in that particular team, that there was sort of... Um, what you'd talk, say quite tough footballers in the likes of Robbie Dewayne and Dave Dewayne are a big gospel family so they, they tended to look after you if um, a big six foot two centre forward sort of clattered into a, a sort of 16 year old being pulled mm-hmm. of a goalkeeper Do you think the um, you know you said you didn't get in that that was sort of a blessing disguise do you think you've improved further you know because it toughened you up going into these Sunday league sides and you know you learn how to get back up, you know, from disappointment. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I had a chance when, when I got released, I had a chance to go over to Portsmouth and play on the youth side, but I, I just chose to, to, to enjoy um, the football and, and the social side of it. And they, they were they were sort of tough leagues, so um, they, they did, did harden you up. I think a little bit of the problem now is that they, even at non-league level, there are, you know, we operate as an academy, they tend to play in their own age groups. Mm-hmm. So you don't see um, you don't see that sort of almost natural regression. Very rarely do you see, I mean, I went to down the Pruitt a few times, and you don't see a 16-year-old, 17-year-old playing in the first team, whereas I can remember playing for Gospel Borough Youth down at... Um, um, the Salton playing fields in a pre-season friendly and Gary Jurif was playing at right back who's a year older and um, Tony Prickwood and Peter Edgar immediately took him out of the youth team and, and, and took him with the first team um, and you don't seem to get that now it, um, even when you go around the Wessex League I mean I tend to pick a game to, to watch if it's not Saints or Gospel or, or haven't might go to Porchester and, and we watch the Wessex League game and you don't see too many youngsters playing sort of below the age of about 20 Whereas I think going back in 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 sort of when we were coming through, you did, and I think that was partly because a lot a lot of youngsters came up through um, sort of the local leagues, like the Gospel and the Fair and Sunday League was strong, Pompey Premier was strong. Um, I played in the at 16, 17, I played in the Dockyard Premier League for a side called Cup Mountain, and that was a really physical, strong league. And I think that does progress you quicker. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's any reason why these Sunday League? leagues have fallen off uh, I just think it's um, it's just a generation thing I mean now if you go um, I mean facilities aren't great I, um, 
I don't think that helps. I mean, um, if you think of um, uh, the Privet Park change rooms outside, um, not the cricket club, but the ones with the little place over the back mm-hmm. towards the tennis courts. I mean, that was like that in 1970. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. so, and it was like that before 1970. So, I mean, if you think now they have the option, and a lot of them do, they will go and play in the five-a-side leagues at night. Um, and they play two games, 40 minutes, um, games with their mates, have a drink, and they, and they go home. And I think facilities might play a part in it. Um, because, you know, if they, they're playing in the five-a-side league, they're playing on a, a decent, decent 3G, it's clean, um, they can have a decent shower afterwards and, uh, and a pint, whereas if you go there on a Sunday, you're changing the crap change room, um, showers aren't particularly great in there, and the pitches have deteriorated. Um, a lot. I mean, the pitches outside of Privet used to be, um, you know, immaculate at one time when I, I remember starting playing there and you like playing there, but now they, they are sort of um, basically nowhere near as good as they were. Mm-hmm. Do you think, are clubs more look, looking at players that are playing in five sides, you know, leagues and teams? The more cl- clubs look at well, it? Yeah, know, are they increasingly the looking towards team. those as Sunday League yeah. start, leagues drop off? Yeah, the, the problem with it is we get um, players who, uh, you know, even when I was at Gospel and I did a football development centre at Farron College where I was a lecturer for um, 22 years, you, you get what I call a lot of strict footballers coming now. Mm-hmm. So they, they are what we say with five or five side players. So they have no knowledge of playing an 11 side game. Mm-hmm. Um, and they come on to a football scheme because they like football. And then you'll sort of almost re educate them in the 11 side. Um, but you can't doubt the technique and the skills they have. Mm-hmm. And then, so, was where was it that what Sunday League side were you playing for when you you left? You decided not to go to uh, Portsmouth Academy. I didn't. Um, I mean, I came when um, I, I went in and played in for in the Gospel Family on mm-hmm. a uh, Saturday and Sunday. Um, for Brockenus and Achilles, there were a few yeah. gospel players in the Achilles side at the time. People, uh, Tony Mahoney, I think Richard Colbert played a few games. Steve Boswell, um, and most of the players who played on on a Saturday for gospel played in the Sunday League at mm-hmm. the time. Um, from there, I actually signed for gospel in 1970. I think it was 70. It was actually when I left the list by Saints in 76. Mm-hmm. Um, went pre-season training. Um, obviously, uh, Tony Tony Milne was the first team goalkeeper, um, mm. and then during that season, I got um, I, I, I got rushed in the hospital. I had um, adhesions on um, an old um, appendicitis I had, mm-hmm. um, so I was actually out for about three or four months. And when I was in hospital. Um, my father was helping um, Arthur Windsor run Bulls Legal Reserves, mm-hmm. who were uh, playing in the old Hampshire Division 1, same league as Gospel, and they wanted cover for a goalkeeper, so I actually transferred while I was in hospital. Um, <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Which is a bit funny, I was trying to transfer a film to an hospital bed, um, <laughs> and then I ended up going, after getting fit, playing about seven or eight games for Bulls Legal Reserves, um, and then um, to cover Trevor Gilbert at Glandular mm-hmm. Fever. Um, mm-hmm. Trevor got fit, um, and if he was on contract, he came straight back into the side because they couldn't uh, afford to play a goalkeeper who wasn't playing. Um, and yeah. I ended up, ended up over at um, having, what was having Town Reserves then, um, playing in the course of Premier Saturday League for about the last eight or nine games, and then that following the season, 77 I actually signed for having um, town. Um, uh, Barry Jack was the manager who was the former Waterlooville centre forward and actually played there for um, sort of three, I've had think of three seasons there before I came to Gospel. Mm-hmm. Was it, do you wish you stayed at Gospel at the time or do you think it was the right decision to go? Because you uh, said about Tony right, Mill being the first. It was the right move. I mean, Tony, Tony Mill was a, was a, was a class goal. Keeper, I was all, you know, he did sort of coach me and give me tips from the age of about 15 onwards. Um, but I think that's a little bit the problem today. I think 
younger players want to be involved in a higher league setup. Mm -hmm. So, like, sometimes you have to go away and and, and learn learn by mistakes in a in a decent league setup. And the Hampshire League at the time was a, was a was a good league. Um, I replaced um, over Haven. I replaced Neil Hard to um, play for Waterlooville. Um, and obviously he went to Plymouth, so he had a pro contract at Plymouth. So, and it, and it was a hard league. The Hampshire League was a hard league. If you were six, um, 17, um, mm -hmm. it was a hard physical league. Um, it did help play and haven't because they were they were physical side. The first year I was there, we got relegated yeah. with um, with a good side out of Hampshire one. The, the second year um, we it changed around a little bit. Um, we had younger players come in. Um, similar to what gospel were they were all local they were all having or, or league park lads and we got promoted back up and we got to the Hampshire senior cup final as a division two side where we, we lost to newport two nil um and i think that season i actually signed back for gospel i think Pete, Pete, peter mullis came around at my house who was my ex PE teacher mm -hmm. um who was quite influential when i was younger um Sort of pushing me into Hampshire schools and that to sign um, a summer league form, but I only signed his cover. Um, and then I did um, one more season again, I think probably at a dual sign with Gospel um, in, in Hampshire one um, with Haven. Um, and then um, Tony Brickwood, Pete Ecker, and Pete Mullis asked me to sign um, in, I think it was, it was 81 82. Yeah, um, 80, uh, 1980, you mentioned. Said. Yeah, I think that was 80, I think 81, 82 I actually yeah. signed for, for Gospel um, because the reserves were playing in the same league as Haven mm -hmm. and, and being local and Pete Mullis I think was reserve team manager at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but playing those Hampshire League, you know, I had three years at, at Hampshire League level one um, and that's, that's the way it was done then. Younger yeah. players, if you didn't, if you couldn't get in, say so gospel had gone into the Southern League at the time, so, so you took the next best level down to try and learn a trade, well, learn goalkeeper, learn how to play at centre-half or, or centre-forward. Um, nowadays, I think some of the youngsters are quite happy to sit on the bench and be associated with a Southern Premier League club and, and not get game time. And the only way you learn is by, by game time. Mm -hmm. And you sort of mentioned about how you, know, you played with a lot of the players that were in that gospel team and the Santa League side, your the assistant manager and reserves manager, Pete Mullis was your ex PE teacher. Do you think a lot of those players you'd know was a, a factor in you going to gospel and as well your father also had him playing there? I think, uh, you know, I lived, I mean, I've, I've lived in gospel all my life. Um, work wise, I've not had to move out of gospel. I think um, from watching from an early age, I mean, I can remember sort of. 10 or being 10 or 11 years old and um, going to watch the, the first thing play and propping the bike up against the, the fence and, and standing like leaning over it. I think all probably always, I had no aspirations of being a, a professional footballer. Mm -hmm. um, that was just something that, you know, happened when I, got, I had a chance to, to do it and it didn't work out. Um, so I think levels were always set around sort of clubs like playing for gospel. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Pete Mullis was quite influential. I mean, um, he was a PE teacher at Privet. Um, I played Hampshire schools at under 16 level, and that was mainly due to, to Pete. I mean, he wasn't even teaching. I was at Bay House. I think he was teaching at what was the Fair Academy, which is now Neville Lover. Mm -hmm. And I came home one day, and he was in he was in the front room with my dad, and they he wanted me to go to Cal Shop for Hampshire schools trials. Um, um, even though he wasn't even manager of the Gospel and Fair and District side. Mm -hmm. um, but he sent me up there, and from there I put in the Hampshire School side, and then it sort of took off with, you know, once you get to that level, pro clubs try to watch you. But um, I think really sort of being in the round, I mean, a lot of my schoolboy days were spent around Privet Park anyway, by the cricket pitch or over there playing football in, in the summer holiday. So, so it always probably did point back to Gospel, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Would, did you have any hesitation of leaving Waterlooville? You were sort of a bit on the up, you know, you got promoted, got to the Hampshire League uh, final. Haven't, like, haven't, haven't town then, 
Cabin Town, sorry. It was, it was Cabin Town then, they amalgamated um, yeah. a couple of years later. Um, yeah, I mean, we played at, um, it, they play at Westley Park now, obviously. Mm. Um, and um, I can remember getting taken down to where Westley Park is now. They took me down because towards the end of the season, um, I'd sort of said to them, oh, I might, I'll probably go to Gospel next year. And I remember um, the centre half, Ray Jones, I think he's involved on the, the board, I haven't now. Um, they took us down to where the Westley Park is. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, in two or three years' time, this is going to be our new ground. And it was about, it was just almost like a marshland with like 10 foot reeds growing out of it. So I, I just thought to myself, well, it's not going to be next year. And if you'd have seen front lawn at the time, it was um, uh, n not the best place to play your home games. Um, <laughs> Uh, locals used to pinch the firewood if it was cold in the winter you'd be playing a game and the locals would be taking the, the um, feather edge board and fencing off to keep themselves warm so I think it was a, just a natural move to come back to gospel mm -hmm. but the three years I had it happen were, were, were very similar to gospel in that they were all local mm -hmm. um, I probably was one of the few outsiders um, coming in sort of um, about 15 sort of about 10 miles away uh, but there was a good bond there, um, like Sir Tony and Trevor Plumley, um, Simon Pope, who, who I managed to get to sign gospel a couple of seasons later. Um, mm -hmm. And there was a good um, team bonding, and it was very similar um, to sort of what gospel was when I, was, when I ended up at gospel. You said about being an outsider at the start. Was that a bit difficult? Because you going into an established restaurant that all knew each other from a young age. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I haven't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no. Not they. No. Not not really. They were, um, you know, very sort of supportive. You come in. Um, I mean, when originally when I went there, um, they were sort of an aging side. In fact, mm -hmm. I think probably everybody would have been. It may be sort of late very late 20s, 28, 29, um, and the rest would have been in their early 30s. When the following season, when it changed, we became a lot of the younger side, so we were all around the same age. We were all around mm -hmm. from about 18 through to about 22. So you have, you have similar interests, um, that type of stuff, so it made it um, very easy. Yeah. And then, so you talked about, who. so who was it exactly, did you say that, convinced you to join gospel was it pete morris in the end or was it um, someone I mean, else uh, uh, tony brickwood and pete edgar um and pete morris sort, sort of all sort of made an effort which mm -hmm. obviously makes you feel wanted um as i said pete morris was um it, um quite influential that i say based also do always remember him for the Hampshire schools because he pushed me that way because he wasn't even my PE teacher at the time and i don't even think he was uh, he wasn't even running Gosport and Fairham schools and um, I remember going up there as the only Gosport and Fairham schools sort of um, player um, so we had there was all the shot um, Southampton so all the local district schools in the area and I was the only so Southampton would have had six or seven players up there on this week's trial mm -hmm. um, so he was very influential um, and also when I went there I had no um, no real visions of playing in the first team um, yeah Pete Mullis was the reserve team manager and I, I was happy to go and play at the same level and may get, maybe get a few chances if there are injuries mm -hmm. um, and that type of stuff. So, and and Tony Brickwood and Pete Edgar were sort of um, quite astute people as well. So um, uh, their management style was quite, quite unique, quite clever. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, so all three of them really sort of influenced a little bit. So was it one of those things you joined, then you went into reserves, or did you go straight away into the first team? No, it was a bit. It was a bit of a strange. It was a bit of a strange one, really. We I played. Um, we had quite a strong reserve side, and we played. The summer league started earlier than what was the old Hampshire league, mm -hmm. um, and we played a friendly down at Privet, and um, the first team played away at Chelmsford, mm -hmm. um, and they drew three all, and. To us, that was a really good result. Where once we finished the reserve game, we were in the clubhouse, mm -hmm. and um, so 
we thought that's a really good result through all right to Chelsea because Chelsea were one of the bigger clubs in in the Southern League. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the following um, the following Saturday, um, I end up in the in the first team playing against Crawley, mm -hmm. and um, what so what what happened for about three or four games was obviously they, they left Tony Milne out, who um, was a was who I knew really well and it helped me a lot. Um, I ended up playing on the Saturday against Crawley, mm -hmm. um, and then we went on the Sunday to. It wouldn't happen now. We played Saturday. I'm a deputy against Crawley. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the Sunday, we went caught an early ferry over Sherbourg and played Sherbourg in a, in, a, in a friendly. So, and then we caught the ferry back the same day. Um, and it went through a spell where um, Tony and Pete, they would drop four or five players. Mm -hmm. But the first, three or, first four or five games, we never had the same side, um, and they would be, it would be three to four changes every every week, um, and eventually they settled on their what their what their eleven was. Now I was a bit surprised because Tony Milne was, was a really good goalkeeper, mm -hmm. um, in fact, probably as good as there was in non-league. Um, but I think they again, I was talking about giving youngsters a chance. I think they just felt it was time for time for time for a change um a few youngsters came in um i mean gary was already playing um people like steve ingman eventually came in and they sort of evolved it a little bit over the years so so said steve ingman came in i mean they had two good center halves in steve ingman and andy by um andy by went to left to go to fairham because they just they sort of made a choice on steve ingman um mm -hmm. who went, went on to have a good career with tony mahoney as two and a half um, as did Andy Boy in non-league football as well um, so they were quite clever at evolving the side with three or four sole changes um, but at the time probably when I went in I don't think I was probably quite there but mm -hmm. they sort of stuck with me throughout that season after the Chelmsford game so I'd actually only ever played one reserve game which was pre-season friendly mm. Was it a bit odd or did you feel a bit guilty um you know, replacing Tony Mill, you mentioned about you known him since the age of 15, it sort of helped you along your career. Um, no, well, not, no, because he's, because Tony's um, a sort of bit of a down to earth guy. And I can remember mm. him saying to me, I mean, I think he'd been left out of a few games in the previous seasons. Mm. There was, um, if my memory serves me right, there was um, a goalkeeper, Bob Stowe, I think, who came down from Gloucester City. Um, who played a, a, a few played had a had a run in the side, um, and I can always remember Tony saying to me, um, and he correct me if he's wrong, but I can remember him saying to me once in the change room when we're on and having a chat. He said, "I'm happy now that it's you replacing me." Mm -hmm. So I think he had in his mind that he wanted someone to replace him. Yeah. Um, sounds a bit strange talking about all these years, but I can I can remember that, and he and he was supportive throughout. Um, and I think I I got a feeling Tony didn't play the following season. Um, I think that was it. He sort of, he he packed up. So I mean, he gave us a lot of um, instruction early on, and I mean, watching him, um, we weren't the same type of type of goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's probably a lot more dominant. My strength was sort of shot stopping, um, but he even sort of mannerisms a little bit by the way he kicked the ball and sort of walked about in the goal. He, he tended to copy, so mm -hmm. um, it just felt a sort of a natural. I think to him, it was almost like a natural replacement. Yeah. Do you think him almost essentially being a bit of a goalkeeping coach to helped that jump from the Hans League yeah, to the I Southern think, League? I, I, I wouldn't say coach because, um, believe it or not, goal, we, we didn't have coaches. So yeah. you, you virtually learn on the job. He would give you little tips. So, mm -hmm. for example, just one that he, he gave us, he said, like, if you're coming for a cross and you can't get it, just fall over and yell, you'll get a free kick nine times out of ten. Yeah. So it was, it was little, little guidances um, like that. Um, you didn't really have coaching, um, which is... Um, it was all sort of, you know, Tony would have, Tony was a natural goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. um, I never really had, even when I was at Southampton, we very rarely had goalkeeping coaching. I mean, they used to throw balls in for you to come and take crosses and call keeper, but mm -hmm. that was as far as it actually went. Um, so the goalkeeping coach.
coaching thing has probably only been a fad for um, probably the last 20, 25 years, mm. really. Yeah. Um, Do you think that's something, you know, would have helped you, you know, maybe in going further in career, you know, you have something like that. Do you think that's maybe team um, missed out on it a lot? Or do you yeah. think it didn't matter at the time? I'm not too sure because, I mean, I worked a little bit for the Portsmouth School of Excellence mm -hmm. um, going back um, in the late 90s, 2000, doing the coaching. And sometimes a lot of, lot of goalkeeping is natural. So angles yeah. are natural, reactions are natural, your agility is natural. Um, and I used to get kids, um, kids over there who were great running around cones without looking at them, but mm -hmm. couldn't catch a ball. They couldn't catch a ball properly, and they were coming in at the age of six or seven. Um, and so I did like a group from seven up to about fifteen. And um, I remember telling the Sean North, I said, "Where are you getting some of these lads from?" And he said, "Oh, we'd so and so's watched him play in the small side of game." And I said, "Well, just send through, just send a few who can catch a ball, and then mm -hmm. we we go from there." So I think there's a lot of emphasis on footwork now, um, at, at that type of stuff. Um, whether goalkeeping's better now, whether it's, I, I don't know, I mean, the balls are different, the balls move quicker, and the game's changed. I mean, bearing in mind, I played my last game in 1990, so that's a long time ago. You could still pick up the back pass, so mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a totally, the goalkeeping is a totally different game now. Yeah, and then, you know, Gosport were at the time in the Southern League, and you've moved from having, which were in the Hads League. Was that a big, shock to the system almost you're playing against better players you have to travel a lot further you know you even mentioned that the start of the season started early was that a big shock at first or were you able to manage that no i mean that was the, the season started um season started the norm i mean there was we were talking about it on saturday actually because um the crossover of cricket isn't as, as much now you don't get many footballers playing cricket where mm -hmm. at the time um when i started playing Second team cricket, gospel, and first team cricket. You had a lot of footballer cricketers, mm -hmm. and, and and they could play. So um, it yeah, it wasn't a shock that the standard was um, a lot higher. Um, and at times in that first season, I I, I I had some good games. I had some in different games, um, and I thought at the time maybe Tony should come back in. Mm -hmm. That was that was my gut feeling. Um, but um, Tony probably wouldn't pick a good didn't see it that way. I think they decided that um, they wanted sort of some younger players in the side. I mean, Gary was playing at the time. Um, Andy Lohman was playing. So we were all within two years of each other. Um, so I think that's just the way they, they decided to go forward with it. So, it, I, I mean, I liken it a little bit to um, Nathan Ashmore mm -hmm. when he started at Haven. Um, and now... Nathan's a top keeper. I think he's probably as good as he is outside the league. I mean, when he came to us, he was absolutely brilliant. But when he started to have him, if Nathan, um, and I didn't know him that well at the time, um, before he came to gospel, but you'd read the paper, he'd make a mistake, and he was left out the following game. Mm -hmm. um, it, I was allowed to make a mistake here and there. Yeah. And they, so that builds your confidence up. Um, whereas I don't think now I think it's too quick to change with a young goalkeeper it's too quick to change mm -hmm. Do you think that's because of just almost sort of fast pace of football now you know managers don't have as much time as maybe someone like Tony Brickwood and Pete Edgar had you know they, or is it just just different attitude now? I think as I said I think there's, um, there's I think it's a bit of both um, I mean obviously Managers or coaches sort of are, are employed on results, um, but also um, I think the sort of they don't there is there is a chop and change. So sometimes you got to accept if you're putting in a young centre half or you're putting in a young right back, young goalkeeper, youngsters will make mistakes, but they need like they they're learning on the job. So sometimes you just have to sort of to sort of go go with the flow and sort of say, well, that's going to be part and parcel. When you hear on the television, um, you don't, you know, don't have to know what you're going to get with young players. And, and it, it's only after two or three seasons that you reach a consistent point. So, and also, what, how were 
Pete Edgar and Tony Brick were different to each other as well as managers? Um, that's, sort of, oh, that's quite a difficult question, actually. Uh, I think Pete was... Um, Pete Edgar um, was more of, um, what I'd say, more on the, the tactical side of it. Tony mm-hmm. Brick was a very good man manager um, and sort of knew how to manage, manage players. Um, but what they did is... Um, what they did is they basically built a side which didn't need an awful lot of managing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think now there's a there's a trend with coaches and managers. They do a lot. There's a lot more input. I mean, we would we would train on a Tuesday and a Thursday night. We do um, a lot of running um, up and down the stand, um, um, and then it would be going into a, it go into a five side or a, a, a six side game, um, and then there might be a shooting session at the end. Um, not the way it's, it's done now. It's done totally different. Um, you know, you know, have to put on sessions, but they basically almost built a side that man managed it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Tony Mahoney was a was a terrific captain, um, and there wasn't really before games a lot of team talk because we had a set way of playing, mm-hmm. um, and we went out and played played that way week in and week out in the in the Southern League and then in the Southern Premier League. Um, I think that we played at quite a high intensity each game. So every every league game, certainly in the Southern Premier League game, we almost played it like a like a cup game, mm-hmm. like a straight knockout. And I think that's part of the reason why. I mean, I was there for nine years. Um, we didn't have one decent um, FA Cup or um, uh, the FA Trophy run mm-hmm. at all. I think, we, I think we got through to the last stage of the FA Trophy once um, when Trevor Williams was manager. I think that's because we treated every game almost like a cup final. Yeah. And then, so you talked about, you know, the good league form. I think it was the next two seasons you didn't finish outside the top seven. Was it, was it something you found, you know, you'd done well in the league? Did you find it frustrating that you can do as well in stuff like the FA Cup, FA Cup, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, because I mean, everybody's. I think when you're playing at that level, you you think you, you'd love to have an FA Cup run and draw a, a professional club mm-hmm. and uh, and that. But, uh, but uh, we seem to we lost to sides we should never lose to. And I, think, as I said, I think part of the reason was was that we played one way and it was high. We we didn't have another gear because our gear was always quite um, quite high. Uh, we had a set way of playing. We had Richie Colbert up front. Old John Halls was up front. Um, you know, Gary Juris was a was a superb deliverer uh, of of hitting a, even a diagonal cross from the halfway line. I mean, his right foot was unbelievable, and and that's the way. So we went from back to front quite quickly, um, and but the tempo was 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 quick as well. As I said, because we were competing certainly in the Southern Premier League when when it when they took the top sides and the Midlands was a really strong league. Mm-hmm. And, and, and to even survive in that, we had to give our all in every game. And, and then suddenly, if we drew a lesser side, um, we seemed to struggle. Mm-hmm. Do you think, you know, that maybe you had a bit, a bit of a strong, you know, FA Cup run or an FA Trophy, you might maybe bring a bit more attention to gospel, maybe brought some, you know, not better maybe slightly better players than you could have made that maybe that next jump you know get to that the, almost the, the first division of non-league or do you think the team around was good enough it was just it was just a nearly almost moment not rather um, we weren't good I, I enough think what you've got, oh yeah, I think what we've got to take in the context is that through the year I mean it changed slightly towards the end um and we might talk about that later on. But I mean, from, from when I signed in 81, 82 through to um, sort of 85, 86, um, maybe a little bit later on when um, Pete and Tony sort of stepped down, most of the players were all local. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we all lived in, in, in Gospel, some might live at Fairham, um, but a lot of were still, they were born in Gospel. Um, so I think for us to actually play at a level, probably I don't think that happened again. Where you were probably a squad of fourteen players who were all born and bred in gospel. And then so 
after the success you had the disappointment in the 83-84 um, season of being relegated. What do you think the reasons were for that? Because before that, you know, Gosport were a consistently top half team, you know, apart from in 82, they never finished you know, below fourth in their first four seasons of the Southern League. Yeah, I, I think, um, I don't, I, I had a look actually to uh, go back on the seasons. Um, that might have been the season, and I, I, I don't know, I might be corrected further down the line, but mm-hmm. I think we, um, was that the season we played Puckle Church in the Southwest Pratton Cup? Uh, I'm not sure, let me see if I can find. Let's have a look. Uh, Yes, it was. Yeah, well, I see that. We, um, if I remember right in that game, I think Richie Colbert got carried off. Mm-hmm. I got thinking Tony Callahan went off. Um, and I, I might have been one other, it might have been Steve Boswell, but I think basically, we, I mean, Richie Colbert was. Um, was a you know a terrific centre forward, sort of up centre half, some goalkeepers, and he was a twenty twenty sort of two, you know if not guaranteed a season. And we played this game down at um, Huckle Church in the Pratt and Cup, um, and I think we ended up, so we played on the Saturday, went down on the Sunday, and then I think in that game three players basically um, that was it. Their, se- their season was written off through injury. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think that had a big impact on it. Losing someone like Richie, who, who was a goal scorer, um, uh, was, uh, was a massive miss. So that would have played a part. Um, I don't think we lost too many games heavily, but I just think, we, if I'm memory serves me right, we didn't score many goals from that point onwards. I think mm-hmm. we struggled to score goals. If you're not going to score goals, you're, you're likely to end up towards the bottom of the table. Did you... At the time, think you could bounce back straight away? Was it just a thing of we have we've had these injuries, you know, a bit yeah, of dip, but we'll get back, or was it yeah, a I doubt? Think, um, we, we needed to replace. Um, I think Ali Unit was on board then as well. So he, he started to score goals um, following the season. Um, the following season, Simon Pope signed, didn't he? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I knew Simon from Haven from when he was mm-hmm. um, 16 years old. He, he turned up a training at Haven pre-season. Um, a, a, yeah, a, a very good player, so he could play most positions. So I, I, think I, I sort of got in touch with him and he came over pre-season and, and Tony and, and Pete got him to sign. So he suddenly replaced Richie Colbert with, with, with Simon. Um, I think the... John Halls came back that season as well, didn't he, halfway through? Yeah, he came back halfway through. Yeah, so suddenly it, 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 we, we hadn't really quit. We were doing okay from what I remember that season. We, we, we were okay. Um, and then we just went on this run um, from just after Christmas onwards where um, we sort of kept on winning. And the good thing about it, we were actually playing Saturday and, and, and a Tuesday night, Saturday mm-hmm. and Tuesday. So the games were coming quite thick and fast. And... Um, we suddenly we, we got to the last game of the season against Salisbury. Um, I think we Paul were in with a chance of going up, and we were in a chance of going up. Um, and obviously, the rest is a little bit of history. We won five nil. I think Paul won their game maybe three nil, and we actually went up on on goal average if I remember goal difference mm-hmm. if I remember rightly. So um, that was a major changes. But they brought in players. Um, they brought in players like Dave Lappage came in. I think. Um, some younger players came in that year. Again, they sort of evolved the squad, squad a little bit. So mm. that's where they were they were quite good. That they, they did slightly always change the changing room. It never remained the same. They kept the core. Um, mm. I mean, the core hadn't changed much. I mean, um, Tony, Tony Mahoney was still there. Steve Ingram was playing. I was playing. Gary was playing. Um, John came back. I think Ken Finley. So there would have been sort of maybe three or four subtle changes to that squad. Yeah. And then, do you also, you talked about the Souls from actually won 5 0. Do you remember the um, whole atmosphere of the day? Because there's about 1,500 people there. Did you notice, what, did that change anything in your game or how you felt before the match? 
well, I don't think I probably didn't have much to do with one final. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, there was, there was a buzz around the ground. Um, it was a, it was a sunny day, so there was and it was towards the end of the season. There'd been a fair bit of um, press in the in the Portsmouth news about the game. Um, so I think they were anticipating a, a big crowd, um, and we got off to quite a good start. So um, I, th- I think once we scored the first goal, then we got another second goal quickly. Um, and it sort of eased the pressure off of us. Um, and so to win five nil was a was a good way to finish the season. I, I don't think if we'd won, I think if we'd won by less, we might not have gone up. But I'm not too sure about that. Mm-hmm. So then you return back into the Premier Division of the Seven League. Did you did you change anything that and when you returned back from the first stint in the Premier Division? No, I think. Um, I think well, I say we were replaced. I mean, Simon Pope had another season, didn't he, at, at mm-hmm. that level, um, if I remember rightly. I think it was, and Ali you know, um, got some fitness back. Um, so I think it was just a case of the, the, the year we went down, we struggled to score goals. So um, we, we found replacements for those. Um, and that sort of, if you can score, um, score goals, you're going to win. Win some games. I think in the previous year we went down. We once um, Colby had, had the injury. We were struggling to, um, to sort of um, put size under pressure by by scoring goals. So I don't think we changed it an awful lot. I mean, you know, we still we had a set way of playing, as I said earlier on, and that set way never changed with with Tony and Pete as managers. That never changed at all. That that way we played um, just was maintained over those periods of the years. Mm-hmm. And what, was it at this point that um, Trevor Williams had come in as a new manager, or was it? Do you know what exact season he came in as a manager and replaced yeah. Tony Britwood and Pete Acre? Uh, yeah, Trevor came in in eighty seven, eighty eight, didn't he? Mm. So um, eighty four, eighty five, and then um, eighty five, eighty six. The Tony, uh, Tony, and Pete um, stepped down at the end of the 86 season. I think Trevor came in in 87, 88. Was that a bit of a shock when they left, or was it something uh, that they'd been... I think they'd sort of given indica- indications that they, I mean, they'd been doing it for quite a few seasons. Um, I think there's potentially sponsors coming in um, that they felt maybe that it wouldn't work the way they would, they'd been doing it before. So, I mean, uh, and they indicated the players they're going to move aside. Um, Trevor was an ex-player. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't really, I, ha- I hadn't come across Trevor, but he was more in the reserves the first year I played because he suffered from um, um, a hip, he had a hip replacement. He was suffering from groin injury. Mm-hmm. Um, and then about two years later, he had a, a hip replacement. Um, so I, I knew Trevor. I knew Trevor a little bit through cricket. He played for Trojans. Um, he came, when he came in, he changed it. We suddenly had coaching. Yeah. Um, whereas before, as I said, we were literally fitness and a bit running, running, uh, running around the pitch and five aside. Suddenly, we were doing sort of patterns of play or phases of play uh, with Trevor because he had his full badge, um, and he was a very good, very good coach manager. Um, and and the style changed slightly. Mm-hmm. We sort of start to play. We were real, think going from back to front as quick. Um, we sort of played um, a smaller, shorter game, um, and that was mainly due to Trevor. Was that? Did you agree with that? Did any players think that um, you know you had a system that had worked before, and it was a bit odd to change it? Did any players disagree with, as well, a new style play, the, the passing? No, I mean, it had to, it had to change. We couldn't have carried on just with um, uh, the way we were playing because we had different forwards. So we had forwards in, um, like, Steve Green in was from the island with um, Gareth Williams, who didn't always, he wasn't there long because he went to Aston Villa, but he played on the left or down the middle. Um, so, it, and Richie Moran. So, no disrespect to Richie or Steve, they weren't um, a Richard Colbert or a Steve Boswell. Um, or even a John Halls in the air. I mean, John wanted the biggest, but he did have this. He was quite decent in the air because he'd come from wide position 
and come across the centre half. So we had to go into feet ball. We could go in behind a little bit, but it would be for people to run in behind, like Richie Moran. So the whole um, the whole system had to change because mm. obviously there were different players in there, and that's what Trevor did. Um, so the, the the style the style basically evolved around the players we had. Did you prefer the um, style Tony Brookwood to Peter Edgar, or did you prefer Trevor Williams' style play? Um, it, there was no preference to style. Um, mm. I mean, Trevor, Trevor, had his, Trevor adapted his way of playing to the players we had. We had a similar back four. It was mm-hmm. Steve Ingman, um, Tony Mahoney, Gary Jurieff, left back. Um, I mean, I mean, might have been to Timmy Coke, it might have been someone else. Um, so, it, and midfield change. We had people like Kevin Daltrey who were, were creative on the ball. Um, um, and Gareth Williams, who played in midfield, but were creative on the ball. Whereas before, we had people like Graham Wake um, and Ken Finley, who, who won the ball um, and played it short, where people like Kevin Daltrey could, could pick a pass. Um, so it's really a little bit of the coaching or managing is you, you pick a style of play to suit your players. Mm-hmm. So if Tony Brickwood and Pete Edgar would have been managed of that side, us get, getting out to Gary Wide or getting out to the, to the wide players and, and getting into the box probably wouldn't have worked because we'd got no joy from Richie or Steve in the air. So the, the whole patterns of play change. So um, that's where, I mean, Trevor made the signings. I think he knew how he wanted to play. Um, we built from the back a little bit more. I had to be careful that, um, I mean, Tony Mahoney, as, as good a player as he was, didn't really want the ball rolled to him on the edge of the box. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, Steve Ingman was happy to have it, and, that, and that's the way we went for that season, which proved, in the end, to be successful. Was it something you adapted quite quickly to? But right, essentially being a bit of a sweet tooth, you know, you took the ball into your feet, you passed it short, you didn't kick it long. No, not really, because it was different. You can still pick up the back pass. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, you can throw it to one full back, get it back and throw it to the other full back <laughs> if you're wasting time. So, as I said, it, when I was playing, it was it was totally different. You didn't have to, you, you could pick it up, you could waste a bit of time. Um, and that's how you kill games. I mean, quite often, if you were one nil up, you could get it out to the left back, left back, give it straight back to you. You can roll it into the centre half, the centre half could pass it back. So you'd have five or four or five passes, you haven't gone anywhere. So then they, they, I think they, they bought in a rule where you have to have one pass before it went back to the keeper and then they sort of evolved the keeping thing from there due, due to a lot of time wasting. So, um, no, it didn't really affect me at all. I, I mean, Trevor probably wanted this to be a little bit more dominant on crosses, mm-hmm. um, which I, I think I, I adapted to. Um, but the, 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 that was probably the biggest change, but... I mean, originally when I came in the side, I was told anything on the penalty spot was Tony Mahoney's or, or Steve Ingman's. Mm-hmm. So, or Martin winning the Rebels playing his other centre half. I mean, because we had a, a whole row of, the, the whole back four was six foot or over. Um, and and that, that's the way we play. It changed slightly with Trevor. Um, and not an awful mm-hmm. lot. But um, there, there were subtle changes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you think it would have been all right if the bat law passed being introduced earlier? Um, what, well, introducing the back pass earlier? Yeah, if, they, if you weren't allowed to do a back pass earlier, you know, for example, when you play yeah, that. I think it's quickened up the game a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, not to, I mean, goalkeepers now all have to play with their, their feet. Um, uh, and distribution is a lot better. I mean, the, the, the main reason they did it was to quicken up the game. Mm-hmm. So, um, in that effect, it, 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 it's worked. And then, so, under Trevor Williams, you um, won the Hampshire Sydney Cup in 1988. What was that like? I mean, you went and played at the Dell, if I'm right, against Farnborough? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. correct. Um, yeah, I mean, the, we sort of... I, I, Apart from the semi-final, I can't remember who we played on the on the way to. We played well where in the semi-final at Eastleigh. Mm-hmm. And, and that was where I'm saying Trevor was slightly different is well where he had um, a Ames play for them who actually played for gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had a long throw. And I can remember before the 
one training night, we just spent an hour practicing defending long throws mm-hmm. into the box. And and you would have never never have done that previously. So that's where Trevor made sole changes. We played Yeovil in an FA in an FA trophy or FA Cup game. Um and he gone and watched them play and they they went from back to front very quickly, just put balls in the box from all areas. And we spent again an hour just defending um balls being played in from the touch line from just over the halfway line defending those. So the the Hampshire Senior Cup final, we the semi final we'd worked on defending the long throw at East Fleet. And that's the better I can't remember who we played in previous rounds in that. Mm-hmm. Um, getting to the final we were playing Farnborough who were they weren't in our league but they were um they were sort of flying in their league and were favourites and, and and on the night we just played them off the park. Um, and it uh, it could have been more than what it ended up the result. What was the final result? I can't remember Sam. It was two nil, I think. Let me just remind myself. Yeah, two nil. So they missed they missed the penalty, didn't they? I remember mm-hmm. they missed the penalty. Um so yeah, we played really well that, that day. But we had a threat because we went Steve Green in, Rich Moran, I mean Richie was quick, Steve was Steve was quick. So we always had a threat going behind all the time. So um it was difficult for size to play a high line against and, and Richie Moran was a was an awkward player. Um, I don't know if, it, if you ever saw him play, but he had quick feet. It was all sort of uh, um, elbows, so he was a difficult customer as well. Mm-hmm. And then you mentioned, you know, you've got this cut round in Trevor Williams with, you know, almost that coaching of little details. Do you think the different style meant you could go a bit further in these cup competitions? Or do you think it was just, you know, it was just the season yeah, well, for it. We, we had a run. I think. I think the FA Trophy. We did actually have a run that season. I think mm-hmm. we lost to Windsor and Eton um, in the round before the um, what's now the National League sides come in. I think we lost mm-hmm. to Windsor two 0 didn't we? Um, uh, so we did that. Yeah. So that would be. Yeah. So I think we'd have played. Was it the fourth qualifying round? Or? Yeah, third. It might have been third or fourth. Yeah, the third. So that. that I'd ever been in the FA Trophy mm-hmm. in, um, <laughs> in about yeah. eight seasons, I think. Yes. Yeah. And then also, you know, you mentioned about you previously going as a kid to the Dell to watch Southampton. Was it big, big occasion, you know, instead of going to the stands to watch them, you were playing on that pitch? Um, and that wasn't, it wasn't quite as big because when I, we used to go up there on, um, as an associate school boy, we used to, we used mm-hmm. to go up um, once a week during school time. So I used to go up there on a Thursday mm-hmm. um, and got on quite a few, not not a lot of time, but five or six times we'd actually, I'd actually been taken out onto the, the pitch to train. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, and I'd spend time up there, obviously in, in um, school holidays, we'd go up maybe three or four times. And we always had to go to the ground to, to change, and then we we get a coach to um, what's um, Stone and Lane now um, to train on the university grounds, or maybe at the back of the old county ground. Do so it, a couple of times, yeah. Do you think it helped maybe a bit that it was almost like sort of a another home game because you've been used to that, you've seen the dress room. It wasn't like you would get a big, I don't know, overtaken by the occasion. It was you knew the ground, you know, you knew the dressing rooms and. You, Played on the pit before. There was nothing like it could shock you or you know no, lose I mean, yourself in the moment. As I said, I've been there previously, but I haven't. Um, but I mean, there was. A, I didn't really think about it to be honest, because well, there was a long time from being 16 years old to when I was playing in the Hampshire Senior Cup final for yeah. the, the gospel. So um, it, it, I don't think it influenced it at all, to be mm-hmm. honest. And then, so you know, the season after the Hampshire Senior Cup win. The club finished second before the, the win. Finished 18th twice and 15th. Do you think that Hampshire Senior Cup win sort of took you um, carried on, or not the form, but you know the the occasion of all that? You know the form. Yeah, and I think think we, went on to that next season, if you know what I mean. I think we were struggling in the league up to then, weren't mm-hmm. we? Sam, yeah. One, one point. I don't think we got, got the results we we deserved. Mm-hmm. I think there's a couple that we should have won and uh, 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 or, or 
were on top and then sort of managed to lose it. Um, but I think we were struggling up until that point, and then that that, that win sort of gave us to be a good side like Farnborough in the manner that we beat Farnborough mm-hmm. um, was all, almost a catalyst to sort of go on and do well in the league. Mm-hmm. And then, unfortunately, the next season after that was your final season for the club, in which um, the side was relegated to the West League. Do you think that during that season there was just a different atmosphere around the club to when, for example, you won the Hampshire Senior Cup when you've been promoted before? Yeah, I, I mean, Trevor obviously moved on to, to Basingstoke. He took a few, he didn't take um, all of us, he took, a, he took a few players, a few of us were still on contract. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just a strange season from the start. I mean, they um, and it, they appointed John Wall. Um, he was an experienced manager at Sun League. Um, it, we managed at Walsleyville. Uh, um, I really couldn't. I couldn't really go anywhere. I think I had a year left on my contract. Mm-hmm. Um, and I met John, and John's seen the um, you know a very honest. Um, Honest guy, so I was quite happy to stay. And then um, within about six weeks, he was he it was sacked, and I think it was almost like a, a panic because um, they were he was they weren't signing players, or there was no player announcements. Mm-hmm. Um, so to that start of that season was was all a bit bizarre. I mean, there's three or four of us: Gary Jeriff was staying, Tony Mooney was staying, um, and then they sacked John Wall, which in yeah, the highest right to one or thing it was probably probably the wrong move because he was an experienced manager. Um if you speak to people like Mick Catlin who played for him, you know, they, they would say one of, he was one of the one of the better managers they played for and was a good man manager. So in hindsight it was probably a good appointment at the time. Wrong wrong decision to sack him. Andy Lohman took over, um, who was reserve team manager who mm-hmm. uh, again, I mean friends with Andy but he probably wasn't ready for the job I mean he's only, he was only he would have been um, he would have only been about 31 32 then um, and we actually at the start of that season he got side together and I think we made quite a, from a side built from scratch we were we, I think we made quite a good fist of it mm-hmm. um, for the first uh, I don't know how many games how, how many games did Andy manage that season uh, I'm not sure. Let me see if I find out. I don't know if I've got that. I might have to go and find someone who has that information. Yeah, no, it's okay. I mean, he was. I think he might have done sort of just fifteen. To uh, he, he might have gone on in after. He might have gone up to Christmas. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, ben Roger and Roger Butland and um, Bobby Gill took over. I think that was after Christmas, but yeah. I mean, Andy, Andy sort of made quite a good fist of it. We, I mean, we were we were sort of competitive again, lacking goals. We had different forwards come in from what I remember. Mm-hmm. Um, we he made quite a good signing. I think we signed Clive Green, the ex Portsmouth player, who actually played a couple of games, did really well, and then he that was it. His season was over because he um, had a long term knee injury. Um, so it was just a difficult season all around. Mm-hmm. Um, and as the season went on, um, the, the sort of changing room atmosphere changed, um, and it was a totally different environment to what what being sort of known before. I mean, even when Trevor was there, the changing room was quite a close knit sort of um, community. Mm-hmm. Well, do you think that was the reason, the main reason why you left to go to Eastleigh at the end of the season? A few things stand out, and I, I can't really remember the back end of the season. I mean, mm-hmm. I was, um, I had, um, I had a, um, I, the, the Corby game stands out, mm-hmm. um, and that was, um, I think Andy had packed up by then, so it might have been before Christmas he packed up. Mm-hmm. The Corby game stands out. I can remember us playing at um, home, um, and I think they went down to. I think they might have had three set off. They might have gone down to eight men um, and ended up losing one nil. Um, and we played the whole game with four at the back. Mm-hmm. Um, they literally didn't play a striker. Um, being um, a senior player, I think I went in um, and had a, I think I had a few sort of words which didn't go down too well. Um, 
and then from there, I then remember going, but it was just a never changing revolving door. We started getting players in on loan. We were paying, they were, I think the club were paying a little bit more money to, to other players, which was where everyone been on the same money all those years mm-hmm. before. Um, and I, I think going away, I went, I can't remember exactly where it was. Um, it might have been Grey's End or somewhere like that. And we played a midweek game um, and we got beaten two or two or three nil. Um, and I think we were down by April, if I remember rightly. Um, I think we had something like about eight games without winning. And, um, and it was a midweek game. And, and I was one of the few who got on the coach at Gosport. And I was one of the few who got off the coach at Gosport at about one o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. And, and I was just thinking, well, this, is, this has really changed now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were getting players in on loan from um, Pat or Luke or Amazing Stoke and likes of that. And there was no sort of um, team unity, um, which we'd had before. So, yeah, it was it was totally different different season. And, and to be honest, I played, I think I played the last game at home. Um, and again, there was a little bit of a, a, a bust up in the changing room. Um, at the end of the uh, end of the game, and that was it. I got left out for the following game, which they lost nine mm-hmm. nil against Gloucester, um, and that that was that was his finishing. But it, it's like anything. New managers come in, you know. Roger Buckland, who I get on well, Bobby all came in. I mean, maybe it was the, a, a, a senior player. They have to make their own mark. Um, up until then, I played quite well all season, so um, it it. It, yeah, it was a funny season, but I think it was time. Time was time was right to sort of finish. Um, I'd struggled a little bit with injuries. I played through injuries, and then I think after that, I played one more season um, and, and and finished. So it was a, it was a big change. It wasn't quite the same, and they were throwing a little bit of money at it, and without too much success. Mm-hmm. And when you went to East, Eastley, what was that? How many did you have? One season there. Yeah, again, um, I had um, I had started off. Uh, Don Garrett phoned me. I had a knee operation. Um, knee knee was fine, um, and so East League. I think that might have been the first year of the Wessex League, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we there's three or four of us on contract down there. Mm-hmm. Um, started off. Um, we started off quite well. I think we were above halfway um, with players like Derek Holloway, Mark Barber. And Cliffy the de, de Golden, so we, we didn't pull up any trees. We're doing quite well. Um, then I suffered um, a back injury um, in um, I can't remember how I got it. I suffered a back injury, and so I was out for quite a while. Um, I came back. Um, started, I just played in the reserves up there. When I came back, went out on loan to um, well, I think I. Jules signed for Ando. It was a bit weird. I Jules signed for Ando and never played a game for them. Then I got a transfer from Ando and then Ferrum wanted me as cover. Mm-hmm. So I ended up going to Ferrum and playing, I think it was, someone pointed out on the, um, there's, a, there's a Facebook page um, that I played four games for Ferrum. They were all away from home. Um, I was I was struggling a little bit. I had like a, a, a groin strain and mm-hmm. I was sort of just getting to, not as quick, and I thought to myself, I'm going to get really clouted one day, get injured. So um, we went to, uh, I think it was Hill and Borough on a Tuesday night. Um, got there late. We were sat in traffic, left Fairham at like four. Didn't get there till about ten minutes before kickoff. Um, got changed. We lost two nil, and I got back in, and that was it. I decided that was it. I wasn't going to play anymore. So. Mm-hmm. That, that was it. I think I went back to Eastley and maybe played a couple of reserve games from mm. um, in and um, at the end of the season I called it a day. And it's pure. I, I mean, I had, um, uh, as I said, I was this, this permanent groin strain and I, I spoke to Trevor Williams and, and I had it checked and I had worn a um, bit joint that I'd written, I wish I had resurfaced about 15 years ago. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so that was that was the end. But that whole season, that, that really was, uh, maybe I should have called it and then once I finished at Gosport, to be honest. Mm. And then so after Gosport, did you go into coaching anywhere? No, I mean, I was work, working as a lecturer at Fairham College. So um, they set, we set up a football development centre there, um, which played in the ECFA Premier League. 
mm. um, and did it that way. And then obviously, um, I have Neil McNamara do the reserves for one season when Gospel res- resurrected the reserves, mm. and then sort of um, started working with with Alex for about nine or ten years. How did that come about then? Was that something he came to you with, or? Yeah, originally it was. Uh, originally, I think there was um, a few financial problems one season. I, um, I think there was a. a um, on, they and they had a player shortage. We got a few lads in um, who were from the youth team or at the college, and then sort of I helped him. We helped out Gary. Gary Lee had. Um, I think Gary Lee might have had a, a heart attack or something, so he wasn't about. He was helping him, so we were waiting for him to get back. So I did sort of one season, um, or oh, about towards the end of the season, and then the following season, um, Meg came in as assistant manager. Mm-hmm. Um, I stayed on as a coach, and obviously we had sort of quite successful years, sort of after the initial two or three years where we didn't do too much. Mm-hmm. So, what years were you there with, you know, as a coach for? Uh, well, phew, it would be probably two twenty. So it'd be around, be about two eleven through to uh, no, probably just before that. So um, I was I was assisting Mick because um, obviously I was chairman and vice mm. chairman, and then I met Kate in as manager. So how long ago was that? That was one, two. That was three seasons ago, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. So up until I sort of only sort of broke away from it the year before that, and then um, yeah. sort of did go sort of as a chairman, um, and then vice chairman, and I went back to out Mick because we he had someone else lined up who, who couldn't do it, mm-hmm. um, and obviously Mick left, so that, um, I left. So that was the that was the end of it then. Did you ever have any thought about going as an assistant, or was it just always you wanted to do a bit of coaching, but not? No, I mean it, it worked quite well. I mean Alex was um, Alex was a, a, was a was a good motivator. Um, mm-hmm. um, he had a good eye for a player as well, so he could he could spot players and bring them in. Uh, Mick and myself sort of did the bulk of the stuff on a Tuesday and a Thursday. Mm-hmm. Um, on a um, on a Saturday, it was uh, Mick and um, Alex. They would have the main input if there was slight. Um, you know, you might make something and just pass it on because you can't have too many speak people speaking. If you just have four or five voices in the change room, it doesn't work. So mm-hmm. that, and that's the way it works. I mean, to be honest, um, we the first three years didn't really go anywhere, and I think the first year Mick came, we overachieved a little bit. I think we were doing quite well, but um, and then we fell away. But then bearing in mind, the bulk of that side came from from Andover. Who were mm-hmm. all, who had just about stayed up the previous season, so to end up halfway was a was a was a reasonable achievement. And then from there, it sort of really kicked off over the, the following years. But it, it sort of worked. Um, I would say it would work um, elsewhere, but um, yeah, it's a, it, it sort of worked. And so Alex was um, was a, was a, was a good motivator of players when I first came in. And then so you. Well, you mentioned a bit at the start about your um, work as a. Was it with Hammond, is it? as a, Or youth program development? No, we set up um, about. Originally, it was with Gosport. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we, we set up the. Um, what, what was the academy then? It's slightly different now. Down there, it was based in. Um, I think it's down the kit room down there. Um, mm-hmm. And then, um, obviously, when Ian came in, they had their own ideas about an academy. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were offered, um, we'd, been, we'd been asked the previous year um, possibly to go there, but we, we, I said no. So um, we got the PDA licence, which is a Pro Direct Academy, which is part of Pro, I don't know if you've heard of Pro Direct Soccer. Uh, yes, I have. Yeah, so the PDA Academy is part of that, right, it's part mm-hmm. of that, so we've got the licence for that. Um, and um, the partnership clubs having at Waterlooville. So we, this is the, when we go back in September, this will be the third year of running the programme. So it'll be 10 years in total since I left the college. Um, so, yeah, so it's all, it's all going well. We could have about up to about 45 learners in for September, subject mm-hmm. to COVID. And is it just growing every year? You know, you get more people joining it. 
Yeah, I mean, we, when we were initially went there, uh, when we left Gospel, we went over with, I think, ended up with 24 in the first year. Mm-hmm. Um, it's gone up this year, and hopefully it'll go up um, the, um, this season this season as well. I mean, numbers, we run trials um, sort of regularly um, under the PDA banner. Um, so, um, yeah, all, it's, all, it's all looking good. I mean, we, we don't have numbers because we obviously closed down in, um, mm-hmm. in, in March. We haven't had this since March. So, uh, in the process now, contacting all those who accepted places to see if they're coming in this September. And how is it exactly sort of different maybe to a normal, you know, if a player normally went for an academy of a club? How is it different to this? Uh, the, only, the only main difference, if you're, a, um, if you're a pro club, they would do education just mm-hmm. for one day. So um, the way it works at these um, academies, it's the, um, they do um, education study on a, um, a, we've gone over to NCFD level sport, mm-hmm. uh, level three sport in um, sport and physical activity. Um, so they would do that each day. Um, and then they will train sort of in the afternoon or in the morning for a couple of hours. So um, I've got obviously uh, Joe Oster that does all our coaching. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a very good coach. Obviously, he was at Gospel for a while. He's now Oxford City. So he does all the coaching. We've got a full-time lecturer and um, I sort of just um, oversee every sort of aspect of it. Mm-hmm. So um, it's not an awful lot different to an academy, but you'll, you have more education, whereas they would only have it one day a week. Sounds good. Do you think um, that's sort of the same remit with what Gosport trying to set up the Centre of Excellence? Do you think he'll hopefully work out to the same success as, as you've had, you know, growing numbers coming in each year? Yeah, I think it's the, the, um, I mean, they run a similar programme for Vincent. I don't, um, not necessarily sure the model works with um, having it with a, um, with a college because mm. tight, um timetables sometimes change. We had it at Fairham where um, time change, timetables would change every term. So one minute you'd have like 30 kids to train and the next minute you'd only have um, 10 or 11. That mm-hmm. might be different. I think um, it's, it's um, I mean, learners who come to the, the academies outside of colleges are um, slightly different. They want to try and progress in football, but the education is important. So uh, I'm not, I think to, to for be successful, you need to bring it in house. Really, mm-hmm. I mean, we, I mean, Gospel added a uh, good academy side down there, um, one, two, four years ago. The likes of Alfie Liss, Jack Bree, Dale Mason, Lewis Watch. That was the um, last, when last year in the conference, um, and we had a, had a good side down there. And they probably missed a little bit of a trip before Ian took over. Mm-hmm. Where they, the following season, they could have cut their cloth a little bit and gone with youngsters and taken a hit um, and then rebuilt from there. But they obviously chose to go, go another route. So, yeah, it's, um, it's, it, it, could, it could work. I mean, Pat and, and Joe, I know, and work with the players, they're good, good young coaches. Um, it's a case of whether Gospel Borough as, as a club will attract youngsters in. Mm-hmm. And so, my final question before I let you go is. Who are the three best players you played at with at Gosford? Uh, I'll probably upset a few people. I think Gary <laughs> Jurif was Gary Jurif was one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, terrific right back, quick, uh, had good recovery um, and good delivery. Um, I probably have to say uh, I'll go for a centre half. I'll go for um, Tony Mahoney. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, for obvious reasons, was a good leader. Um, good in the air, um, you know, just just a good all round player. Um, Steve Ingram was was very underrated, I think, because he got overshadowed by Tony a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think third one would be I'd have to probably say Gareth Williams, although he didn't play that long um, to to sort of get a move that quickly from non league football once he started playing on the mainland. Um, was uh, I mean he was a uh, sort of different class to anybody else when he played. Mm-hmm. Well, that's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank Tony for joining us. Did you enjoy yourself? Yeah, it's very good, Sam. Thanks very much. And I would like to thank everyone for listening and goodbye.